so excited you're here. Some of you came in here this morning just thinking, okay, we're going to continue in our uh, Hebrew series, and, and many of you are looking forward to that. We're going to change it up here this morning. Uh, we're going to get some really busy weeks coming for, for me, not that that's a major excuse, but that is part of it. Uh, I'm going to do a series that I did with the teenagers uh, uh, two weeks ago at camp. They've heard it. We saw an immense impact out of them. We saw how God stirred their affections. Uh, for some of you, you'll recognize this is an old series, but just hang in there. Uh, I really felt like this is the, uh, the series that we need to hear during this time as we navigate through life and our current season in the life of the church. Now, when you hear the word surrender, oftentimes there's this, you know, like reaction that we get by it. Like it's a reaction of surrender's not good. When you think about surrender in any context, we just have these, all these negative connotations of surrender. When you think about historically, what does surrender mean? People used to have the, the, their, their shields, they'd put it up in their head, and that was the indication that they were surrendering to the adversary. They were surrendering to the enemy that was coming before them, and they would raise their shields. It wasn't until 109 AD where we hear uh, Cornelius Tacitus talk about the white flag of surrender. That's where we first hear it, and it would become the example for generations of how you indicate to your enemy that you are actually surrendering, that they indeed are having the victory all the while you're suffering all the defeat, right? And that's where we get the first, you know, flag, the white flag that now has become so associated with the act of surrender. And so this series is going to be all about surrendering raising the, right, the white flag. Because many of us, we have this image of surrender that is, like I said, negative. But what if, what if the act of surrender, the very act of surrender was actually a positive thing? What if there was actual power in the act of surrender, and it's particularly as you surrender to God, and you surrender certain things about you to the Lord, and so there's, there's, there's something about, like I said, surrender that just has a, is a bad taste in our mouth. After all, we're, what do we say about our own flag here in Gonzales? Come and take it, right? We have this pride on come and take it. We have this inherent pride deep within us that refuses to give up, to quit, to, to, especially before the Lord. And yet sometimes that's exactly what God is doing in our life. He wants us to surrender now, you also got to know when to surrender and how to surrender to them, right? I still remember my early 20s, many, many decades ago now. My early 20s, I still remember my brother calling me, saying, hey. He was in, uh, uh, at UT uh, Austin at Longhorn. No disrespect to the Aggies here. I mean, that's what he was. You know, we, we give him a little grace. So he was at UT Austin. He calls me and says, hey, we're about to go paintball. Uh, we're going to sh- shoot some paintballs out there and Who's ever done paintball? Anybody here? All right. It's fun, and it's also not fun. You know, it's fun to pull the trigger, get all those paintballs out of the, out of the, of the gun, but it's not fun getting hit by a lot of those little balls coming at who knows what type of velocity, and if it hits you in the neck or on the jaw or, you know, some other place, it's not fun anymore. So, but I remember, I've never done it before. He calls me, says, can you come? We're going to play. We need some more players. It's like, sure. I'm so excited to get there. Uh, to the engineering department at UT. That's what, my brother was an electrical engineer. That's what he was studying. I said, okay, so we drive to the place, and lo and behold, we see our adversary, the mechanical engineers. And I'm thinking in my life, man, I've never been in a place so full of nerds. You know, it's like you got electrical engineers, you got mechanical engineers, and you had me in there. And I was thinking, man, this is like crazy. And so in my enthusiasm, in my excitement, I'm super thrilled. I'm, I've never, you know, had done that before, and I'm just super excited. The instructor is saying stuff. I don't know what he's saying because I'm too excited. I just hear blah, 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 excitement, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the safety stuff, man, out the window, I didn't catch. So here I am. I'm with the electrical engineer uh, group, and the finally we get started. And I, we're running everywhere, you know. The advantage of being short and fast is... 
that you're short and fast. And so uh, I'm running everywhere. I'm ducking. You know, there's all these obstacles. I'm hiding. I'm, 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 I'm kind of sensing all these, this, these balls going through and beside me. I'm thinking, man, this is awesome. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, out in the distance, I see these three young people from the mechanical engineer department, and they think they're all covered up. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I just hit gold. So I started, like, crawling, and I started getting closer to them. And uh, which, by the way, um, before I continue, part of the rules of, like, when you go out there and do, you know, that, that game is you can't be too close, right? If you're too close, you can't be shooting because it hurts more. Well, fast forward. Here I am. I see them. I start going towards them. And as, a su- soon, as soon as I see them, ta 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 they're like, we surrender, we surrender, da, 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 da. and I'm just like, ah, I'm right, right on there. They're like, hey, man, we surrender. And so finally, the, I guess the, the ref, or whatever he's called, is like, they surrendered, man. They surrendered. Let him go. And I'm just like giddy with a trigger, and I felt really bad for them, and they were really, really upset at me. And I was like, hey, I just, I just got trigger happy, you know. And, but at that point, it didn't feel good for them to surrender. I mean, literally, it didn't feel good. They were feeling, a, you know, just a head of a whole bunch of the paintballs on them. And, and, and I'll bring, I bring that just to say that the act of surrender, whatever it is, whether it's physical or even spiritual surrender, it is difficult. It is, it, it is like teeth uh, grinding and difficult to surrender certain aspects of our lives that God is saying, I want you to surrender that to me. I want you to give me that of which you hold real tightly to me. I know that brings you comfort in your life, but I want it. It's really tough. And sometimes we're in the other end feeling all these paintballs hitting us, all these, like the Lord saying, you need to surrender to me, to God. And this is my point, is that when you surrender, you're, 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 in essence, giving the other person the victory, right? That's why we, we fight against that. We fight against that because we're giving somebody else the victory. But what if in that act of surrender, you actually had the victory? What if the act of surrender wasn't an act of defeat or just an act of defeat, but it was actually an act where you, as a result, had victory over your life. And that's what I want to explore over the course of the next couple of weeks because I want you to have that freedom that comes with surrender. I know the flesh inside of us strongly wants to hold on to certain things. And what I'm saying to you is that that holding on is what's keeping you from experiencing God's best for you. When you go at war, you don't go at war to surrender. You go at war to fight. And many of us are fighting certain things that we're keeping in control of that God is saying, I need you to stop fighting. I need you to lift up the flag, the white flag of surrender. And the big idea over the course of the next couple of weeks is going to be this. When you surrender who you think you are, you start becoming who God says you are. When you surrender who you think you are, you start becoming what God says you are. So that's what we're going to explore. I'm going to explore with you a couple of things. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bust up your toes because I'm, I'm going to be talking today about inadequacy, not feeling good enough and surrendering that. Next week, I uh, hope to get to you on control. For those of you who like control, you have to have it your way. And then I want to talk about the right to be offended, to surrender this right to be offended. Oh, my gosh, some of us will get offended for the smallest of things. And we start harboring resentments. And and, and maybe that's what God is calling you to surrender to him. And then you're longing for approval, people pleasing. Many of us are so quick to try and please other people. And all the while God is saying, stop it. Focus on pleasing me. Now, this inadequacy, we've always, all of us have at some point experienced the sense of inadequacy. If you're a parent, you could probably experience a sense of inadequacy, of you're not good enough. You know, when you go to the HEB, right, 
Now, my kids happened to be, not at first, but eventually became the, you know, the little ducklings that follow Mama Duck. Marisa would walk, they'd go after her. If I would go this direction, they wouldn't follow me. They'd go after her, you know. They were like, you know, they would just kind of follow along. But what if you weren't that family? What, what if you're the other family? And you're seeing the family that has the ducklings following, and your kids are going up the shelves at H-E-B, aisle six, and you're like, Oh, my goodness, you feel inadequate. You're like, I, I must be the most horrible parent that ever lived, you know. They, they, they're not trying to get a can good for me. They're just trying to, I don't know, do some monkey business, go up there, thinking there's a banana or so. I don't know what's up there. They do because they're I've already climbed, you know, all the way up there. But you feel like this sense of inadequacy because your kids are not like their kids, right? Some of you have experienced that. You ha- you're the one that has the circus, or, or some of you have experienced it by what you own, what you have. For many years, you know what I had. I had that little faithful Toyota Echo. I'm telling you, that's not the sexiest car. I think they, they made it with the intention that whoever owned it, like, it was going to be like, this is like, they were going to be, sh- not shame, but they would feel an in- inward sense of inadequacy. I still remember the first time I went to a ministerial alliance meeting, and uh, this is years ago. And we're going to the restaurant that, that exudes masculinity to a certain degree because there's a lot of cowboys there. Which one is it? Cow Palace, right? You look at Cow Palace, truck, truck, bigger truck, oh, ginormous truck, right? So I'm going for the first time, you know, and I'm, I'm driving there and I'm seeing these pastors, you know, just stop and there's, you know, parking spot, they got the ginormous trucks, and here I go with a little echo, beep, beep, you know, excuse me, oh, don't worry, I can fit it there, you know, this is small enough, <laughs> I can fit it between whatever, this car will, it's done me good, but can you imagine, like, for me, I'm like, oh, my gosh, what am I, get, what did I get into here in Gonzales, you know, <laughs> it's exposing all my insecurities as a man, I have the little Toyota Echo, so maybe, you know, it's by what you own, you've experienced that, or maybe sometimes it's by what you see. You scroll through Facebook or uh, Instagram or Twitter, for those of you who still do, do Twitter, uh, or Snapchat, and you're like, man, their life is so good. Look at their life. They're always vacationing, you know. They're always doing this, you know. I wish I was like them. I wish we had the kind of money they did so we can do the things they're doing. And all of a sudden, you feel like you're not good enough. Oh, their marriage is so perfect. No, the pictures are perfect. Oh, their marriage is so great. They probably don't, don't ever fight. You know, he probably is always wooing her. Right? He's probably always gentle and kind, never losing his temper, because the picture doesn't show somebody that would lose the temper. Right? She's probably always very supportive. You know, when when he comes home, he's like, "Honey, let me rub your feet. Let me make you some meals." Uh, one before the other. Let me make the meal first, and let me rub your feet. You feel tired, baby? Baby boo? Right? And, and all of a sudden, we have this idea and this picture that we're, that like, Facebook is reality. And, and you start feeling this sense of inadequacy. You're like, man, my wife doesn't do that. <laughs> you know, my wife, last time she did that, blah, blah, blah. My husband, man, you should see my husband. And all this insecurity just kind of starts plaguing us. Or have you heard the person that when they pray, you feel like, man, the glory of God descended when he prayed. And you tell your friends, like, no joke. This guy or gal prays, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like Jesus himself is in the room. He glows. She glows. You know, how could I ever pray that? And you find yourself praying prayers like, rub-a-dub-dub, bless our, our grub. <laughs> and you're like, I am so far removed from that. And all of a sudden, even their strong sense of spirituality becomes the very thing that you feel so inadequate about. And even spiritually, you're like, man, I don't know, how can I ever be? You know? And we get this, I'm not good enough for that. And then somebody asks you, especially if you're you're around me long enough, (laughs) those of you who have been long enough with me, either in a small group or just in a discipleship group, I mean, I put you on the spot. You know, not everybody, so don't, don't be squirmy. Uh, but I'm like, hey, would you pray? And then I, this is what I do. Hey, would you pray? I close my eyes real quickly and I look down. You know, so they can't say no. I'm serious. Like, I'll do one of those, like, Robbie, will you pray for us? 
And so Robbie, he has no choice but to pray because he can't look me in the eye saying, I'm too scared, you know, I can't, I'd rather not. It's like he can't do that. He's on the spot. He's like, Robbie, would you pray, please? Bonk. You know, and so all of a sudden when something happens, like, something like that happens, you feel what? Insecure. I'm not good enough. How can I ever do it, right? That's exactly what I want to tackle over the course of this series, and specifically today, the sense of inadequacy. How to surrender your inadequacy, your sense of not good enough. Because maybe for some of you, you feel that way because of the way you grew up or the things you have experienced. For example, for some of you, it was unfair criticism that has gotten you to unfair to yourself negative talk. Maybe you grew up with unfair criticism. Maybe you grew up with, with phrases like this that resonate still to this day to you that your daddy or your mommy shared with you when you were growing up. You'll never amount to anything. And maybe it was said once, but that's all you needed to hear. And now what was repeated once is repeated over and over and over and over in your head when you fail. Maybe it was, I wish I never had you. Some of you have traveled that road. Maybe you had an unstable parent, emotionally unstable, and at some point they're like, I wish I never had you. I wish I never would have adopted you. And that's been crippling your life for many years. Your disappointments, you can't do anything right. I wish you were more like fill in the blank. Your cousin, your toothless cousin is a mess. I wish you were more like him because what you are now is like, And it didn't matter who you were being compared to. Or maybe the angelic cousin. All you remember is if you're compared to that person and it still betrays your soul when you're not doing good. You're not good enough. You're a, you're the, you're a bother. You're a bother. Maybe that's not words that were said to you, but that's what you felt like. When growing up, your parents were like, hey, give me some space. You know, because you all need space, you know, or that's how you grew up with, or you're not wanted. See, these things have, re have been recorded in the hard drive of your mind, and, and when a circumstance comes into your life that is, that is uncomfortable, it gets repeated over and over and over and over and over again, and you feel like you're not good enough, you feel inadequate, so you repeat these things, these statements, Never giving yourself the kind of grace that you would give someone that was going through the same circumstance that you're currently going through. Let me, let me say it to you in a form of, a, of, of an imperative. Give yourself the same grace that you give someone else if they were going through the same situation that you're going through. Because we're really critical with ourselves, aren't we? We're more critical of ourselves than any one person could be of us. And it's like we want to one-up anybody else that would come and criticize. So we just go the extra mile, and we just criticize ourselves to no end. And we don't give ourselves the grace that we would give somebody going through a similar, similar circumstance. And for many of you, you need to learn that. I, 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 I teach people that more often in, in counseling than anything else, is to give themselves the grace that they would give somebody else going through the same challenge. You know, for me growing up, it was not like my brother. I mean, as you can tell, uh, he was an engineer. Uh, my brother, he had photographic memory. He could read a book. He could tell you exactly what it said, what page number. You know, he could see it in his mind, you know. And I'm so opposite to my brother, like big time opposite. And with that came a whole bunch of comparison. What can't you be more like George, you know? How can you be at school like George? Why you can't be, you should be more like him. As a matter of fact, it was very clear in my household, particularly with my dad, that I was supposed, I was supposed to be a somebody when I was studying to be a doctor. And rather than being a somebody, I became a nobody by entering the ministry. And boy, was that made clear in my life. And some of you have gone through that, the same, same kind of journey. How about unrealistic compliments? Some of us have, have entered into that thinking of inadequacy because there's unrealistic compliments. 
when somebody is, is saying, good job, amazing, and you deep down know that that wasn't a good job. You just, you really, it wasn't that good. But you get the compliments, and deep inside, now you're trying to live up into an image that people are projecting into you that are saying, good job, when you know indeed that it was pretty bad. That you should have gone more like, hey, do better next time. Or let me encourage you. Here's some, you know, steps to do. But no, no, it's like you have the unrealistic compliments. So you feel pressure to live up to an image that you've created in your mind. And when you don't live up to that image, then you feel this sense of deep inadequacy. That's why we have, like, trophies for every kids, don't we? Oh, my gosh, if I can get rid of the trophies at uh, GYSO, we're almost this close, you know. We took it from trophies. Everybody gets the trophies. Do some get the trophies, some get medals, you know. But we, we raise up a generation of trophy winners. Everybody gets a trophy. Even if you were dead last, you didn't show up. Even if, you know, you didn't show up to a single practice, you're still playing or, or maybe not even play, you still get a trophy. And we've created a culture of wimps, of overly sensitive wimps that can't take criticism because everybody gets a trophy. But we grew up that way. And so we buckle down and we feel inadequate because I'm not getting my praise or my trophy. Again, all of us go through that. Some of you have been paralyzed by fear of failure that gnaws in your spirit and whispers, you're not good enough. Don't apply to that. You're not good enough. Don't do that. You're not good enough. And it gnaws inside of you. And some of you have... have denied yourself the experiences that God has intended for you to have because you hear the little voice, you're not good enough for that. There's the unwise comparisons. Unwise comparisons. Social media, man, do I need to say any more? Right? Social media. Go through social media and everybody, well, everybody's having a great life, you know. And then we get mad when the person, and me included, we get mad when the person is airing out all their junk. You're like, man, let's just keep it quiet. You know, the first year of marriage, I've shared this with you guys before, first year of marriage, Marisa and I went to, to her pastor who officiated our wedding and he who did the, our premarital counseling and went to him and was like, we're struggling. It's our first year. We're struggling in our marriage, you know, and we just want to be like that couple, you know, like Marisa's aunt and uncle. We want to be like them, you know. He looks at us like, you, you're kidding me. I was like, no, they have their life together. They got the two kids, you know, they're like, they're perfect. It's like, you don't see what I see. You're judging their external or their internal by their external. You don't know what happens when that garage closes. And it's real easy for us to fall in love with the trailer, movie trailer, than the actual uh, movie. Ever gone to a movie where you're like, boy, that's such a disappointment. But you watch the trailer, you're like, oh, my gosh, it's going to be the gr greatest Marvel movie. If you're a Marvel fan, this is going to be the greatest DC movie or whatever it is. You're like, this is going to be the greatest movie since the Titanic. It's going to make me cry. Can't wait for it, you know. Since the notebook, there hasn't been a romantic, you know, comedy made. Oh, my gosh, look. At I'm talking more like hopefully the ladies. You're like, I can't wait to cry, you know, unhinged. And my man just comfort me. And then you go to the movie, and you're like, boy, this is what I paid that much money for. Ever been there? So you're comparing now the movie to the trailer, and that's what we do with people. We compare them. We have this trailer of someone, and we think we know that someone, and we compare ourselves according to the trailer, not according to what reality, which we shouldn't compare anyway to begin with. I want you to go to Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Go to Judges chapter 6, verse 11, because I want to give you an example, a real-life example, biblical example of somebody who walked this earth who felt inadequate. He felt not good enough when God was calling him to be a leader of a nation. That's what a judge is. When, you're, when God chooses you to be a judge in that culture, he's choosing you to be a leader. And a judge or a leader of a nation, what they do is that they have... Several responsibilities. They lead military campaigns. They lead in political affairs. And they lead as spiritual examples. 
So you have this guy by the name of Gideon. He's being called out by God to be a leader. In a time when the people of the nation of Israel, they were worshiping other gods. They were idol worshipers. People weren't pursuing God during that time. Gideon gets called. And you would think that God would call this brave man, six foot something tall individual that looks the part to do the part. We're going to see something far removed from that. Something far removed from that. Gideon actually will even put God to the test. When he hears, when he's called, he's going to put him to the test. He's going to be like, man, if that really was you, I'm going to put a fleece outside. If you heard the story, I'm going to put a fleece outside. And if it's wet or not wet, you know, hey, test him again. He, he, because he just couldn't believe that God would call him to or see him in a different way that he saw himself. During this, this time, the Midianites were attacking Israel, and they were stealing the, the crops, and they were stealing the flock. So go to chapter 6, verse 11. It says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah. You see, Oprah shows up in the Old Testament. <laughs> that belonged to Joash. Uh, that joke didn't go. Can you be the drummer to do the bram? So the angel of the, Lord, <laughs> angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak of Oprah that belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. So just picture the scene. Here's the angel of God. He sits down. He's observing this Gideon. And Gideon is not up the hill, up the mountain where you would typically thresh wheat. You know, threshing wheat has the idea of just you, you, you throw the wheat and the, uh, you know, the wind and some other factors help throw out all the impurities. It gets the impurities out. But you do it up in the hill where there's wind, where there's air to do that, to help out in the process. Well, Gideon is not up the hill. He's not up the mountain. He's actually below the mountain, standing in a wine press. What do you do wine presses? Wine presses are hidden because you're, you're stepping on grapes so you can make wine. And it's not in a, in a place where people can see. So Gideon has learned if the Midianites are going to attack and take my wheat, I'm going to go down the hill and hide. <coughs> and that's really important. His location. Verse 12. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you. And he says what? Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior or mighty hero. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And that's what we see. Now, the irony of it all is that he's not being a warrior. He's not being mighty. He's not being heroic. He's not, he, again, he's down the hill. He's not living up to what God is calling him. He's just been called mighty. He's not mighty. Matter of fact, if we were there in the scene and we heard the angel, we probably would have been like, psst, psst, angel, man, you got it wrong. No, he's actually scared. He's actually down the hill. Man, what are you saying? He's not mighty. He's not a hero. You got the wrong guy. He's chicken. Right? We'd be like the truth teller. Like, we see chicken. He's hiding. But the angel doesn't do that. The angel says, mighty warrior. Verse 13. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why, why has all this happened to us? If God is really in my life, why are all these things happening in my life? If God is in my life and with me, why is it that all these things in my life are happening? Where are all the, of his wonders? that our forefathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? If God is real, where are the miracles? Where is he showing up in my life, in our lives? Where is the, the God that I've heard about for many years? I mean, that's raw honesty. You've got to respect the man and a woman who, do, who does that. Who just, they're just raw honest. Like, hey, God, I mean, you're, where are you? And then, then uh, there's the response. Did not the Lord bring us up to, out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Pause you for just a moment. Not only do I not see God working in my life, 
but I feel he has abandoned me, and he's not, he's not in my life anymore. Ever felt that way? Ever felt in your journey like, like where is God? I thought he was real. I thought he was showing, he used to show up in my life, but I feel abandoned by him. Verse 14, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? He doesn't even address his inward insecurities, his sense of I'm not good enough, or his questioning of him and where he's been. He says, now, now, go. But if that wasn't worse in verse 15, but Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. Like God, like my clan is not good. I mean, we're the weakest, we're the smallest, we're the least powerful. You have all these groups, all these tribes. Clans are like tribes, you know, shepherd tribes. It's just like with, with a family name. And he's like, man, my clan is the weakest. We're the weakest of them all. If you have, we're in the bottom of the totem pole. You're picking the wrong person, God. That other person would be better for you. From that clan, from that people group. And then it says, and I'm the least in my family. There's the totem pole, we're in the bottom, and then there's me further bottom. That's how bad I am. Man, that's like being like really insecure and really honest with God. It's like, look at me. I'm not up in the hill. I'm down over here in the uh, crushing grapes in a vineyard that nobody sees because I'm scared. You would almost think the guy would say, oh, that's true. I, man, I didn't realize that. Man, your reasonings for not doing it are legit. Man, how can I have not seen that? I, being God and everything, you know? Well, let me give you a pass, right? But you know what? God doesn't do that. He doesn't always give us a pass. Even when we want it, he says, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites together. He, he says, I'm going to be with you. What else do you want? You're not trusting in yourself. You're trusting in me. I will be with you. And I'm going to destroy all those Midianites. And God leaves him that way. And then what God would do is that he would further test them because he had 30,000 people right? They, they, they come from the nation of Israel. Yeah, we're going to fight the Midianites. And then uh, Gideon says, well, if you're scared, go home. You know how many leave? 20,000 leave. <laughs> like, oh, well, we got the option to go home. All right, we'll go home. I'm scared. And then once you reduce to 10,000 in the army, he's, he says, okay, I want you guys to drink water out of the, you know, uh, out of the river, a pond, whatever it was, and they drink water, and God says, I want you to get rid of some more. And 9,700 go home. And now he's left with 300, under-resourced. Man, if you, if you were struggling with insecurity at that point, I don't know what you call it now, uh, the, the deep desperation for God to show up. And that's what he does in us. Uh, to the degree that you understand how incapable you are and how defeated you really are, and in yourself and in your own strength will be the degree in which you can rest in God. Because what God does is like, no, no. You can give me 30,000 or 300. I can beat the Midianites with 300. Like totally, from a military standpoint, does not make any earthly sense. From, from, a, from a godly standpoint, it makes perfect sense. Who's going to get all the glory but God? When they win and they fight, and they're victorious. It's only by the power and strength of the living God that was before them that they would win. And that's exactly how God wants it. It's exactly how he wants it in your life and in my life. Where he gets all the glory and you get none of it. All you get to do is participate. And he gets all the glory. So here's three things you need to know about you. The first one is this. God's view of you is different than you think. God's view of you is different than you think. You know, there we see it. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior or mighty hero. It was, God's view of him was different. God's view of you is different than the one that you ha currently have of yourself because some of you have this very low view of you 
And God's view of you is radically different. You're a son or a daughter of the living king. And you have promises given to you and you have an inheritance in Christ. And you're not a nobody, you are a somebody in the kingdom of God. God's view of you is very different than the, your view of you. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You're a masterpiece. You're one of a kind. Let me put it in your language, in our language. There are 7 billion or over 7 billion people in this globe, and you're the only you. That's it. You're the only you, and you've been made very unique, and very special to fulfill his purposes. Designed the way you're designed intentionally by God. You're not a nobody. You're a son and daughter of God. Moses certainly could have felt insecure. Man, he botched it up early in his life. He killed someone. He left. Lest he be killed by the Egyptians. He's out in the wilderness for 40 years, and as an 80-year-old man, he's being called by God to free his people. And Moses responds very similarly. He's like, me? Like, you got to be kidding. I'm not even hanging out with the Jews. I'm over here in, in Podang, nowhere. And God says, yes, you. I want you to go back, and I want you to leave my people out. God's view of Moses is very different than Moses' view of Moses. We see it again in David. Oh, David. Cheated on his wives, plural, wives. Took uh, Bathsheba, which he sure enough, took her to be his own. Got her pregnant. Oh, by the way, she, was, she, she had a husband. And in order to cover up the pregnancy, he sends the husband off to war. It puts him in the front line to cover up all, you know, everything. And yet this is the guy? The God uses to lead a nation? Yeah. A God that was broken before God to lead. And then you got Paul, persecutor of Christians. No wonder people were freaked out when they saw him. They're like, oh, yeah, Paul now knows Jesus. Oh, yeah, right. And <laughs> he's not coming to my house. I'm not treating him for any dinner. You know, last time they did that, he sent some Christians to the death knell. And Paul's like, hey, what does Paul do? Like, how, yeah, how the, uh, part of that bloody history of massacring or sending off Christians to be killed. And God says, that's the man I'm going to use to spread the gospel to the non-Jewish world. All of them, a level of insecurity. But God's view of them was different than the view they had of themselves. Number two, God is giving you more than you think. God is giving you more than you think. We saw that. Go in, in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Use the resources you have. Use the strength you have. The battle will be won by God. So you don't just sit down and wait and like, ah, okay, well, we'll see what God does. No, there's some effort involved. There's some work associated with this. That's called faith, by the way. When God calls you to do something, you act on it. <coughs> rather than making excuses. Because there's always an excuse available for not doing what God has called you to do. There's always an excuse available. Who wants to surrender, right? We have all these excuses. Well, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not articulate enough. I don't have the resources. I don't have love. I don't this, this. Write your list out. All of us have it. And yet, in 1 Peter 1.3, it says his divine power has given us everything we need. His divine power has given us everything we need. For life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us to be his own, to, by his own glory and goodness. He has given you the power that you need. By the Holy Spirit, divine power, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is in you. Who will help you fulfill and do the very things he's called you to do. When you forget that, when you forget that he's called you and he will give you what you need, you won't end up in a good place. 
if you work it out out of your own flesh, you won't land in a good landing spot. You have everything you need to accomplish all that God has called you to accomplish. Yes, you have a limp. You're walking with a crutch, and that crutch's name is Jesus. Yes. Many of us want to wait until we have it all together, our life together, our resources together, everything together before we do anything for Jesus. And God is saying, you're missing the point. It's because you don't have it together that I'm going to use you mightily. It's not because you have it together. It's because you don't. It's because you're struggling that I'm going to use you even more mightier than if you were just like, all right, I can do this. Number three, things you need to know about you. Thirdly is this. It's less about you than you think. It's less about you than you think. The whole world doesn't revolve around Jesse. I'm saying it here, this service. I didn't say it first service because Marisa was here. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't revolve around me. It doesn't revolve around you either. It says, Lord, uh, and the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. This is all about God. God is about God. When God calls you to do something, it's less about your power, your resources, your skill, and it has more to do with his power, his spiritual resources, his spiritual skills he's going to give you. You feel inadequate? God is with you. We've got to surrender this lie that many of us have bought into that says it's, all about, it's about your happiness, it's about your comfort, it's about my standards. We've got to surrender that lie because it really is not about any of those things. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. That we would say as a people group, I stand here, all that I know is that about, it's about Jesus. Paul put it this way in Philippians 4.13, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. If he's called you to do if he's called you to do it, he will help you through it. If he's called you to do it, he will help you through it. So what is he calling you to surrender this morning? What did you walk in with? Feeling inadequate about, not good enough. The God is saying, you got to give it to me. I don't feel like I'm a good wife. Give it to me. I don't feel like I'm a good husband. Give it, give it to me. I don't feel like I'm a good student. I don't feel like I'm a good leader. I don't feel good enough. Then give it to me. Give it to me. And watch what I do with what you're insecure about. And your socks will be so blown away. And when you look back, you will have nothing but, but this to say. All glory and honor and praise to the living king who did it through me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus.